I don't know how come I have to keep saying this. I don't really know why I'm the only one saying it. Well, maybe I'm not the only one, because that sounds like one of those Elijah kind of statements. But have you ever felt like, you know, you just don't want to keep yelling at the buffalo herd that's running off the cliff and standing in front of it saying, Turn! 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 You know, because they're going to run you over. You know that. You're going to get stomped on. You're going to get trampled into the ground. But you're not going off the cliff. They're going over. You're not going to fall into that pit that they've obviously rushing headlong into are going to go over that edge of the cliff and fall into the pit. That's what it's like when you hate. You see, whenever you hate and let your emotion destroy your devotion to God, then you're no longer doing or listening to or responsive to the Spirit of God, which, which He is so tender, He wants to direct you towards Jesus, not towards giving you some power that you can go run out and conquer and destroy and kill in the name of God. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. That's not who the Holy Spirit is. You can pretend like He's some kind of consuming fire and pretend that the Pentecostals are right and that it's also overwhelming that you're going to run around, you know, and scream and shout and do gold and, you know, blaze and turn into torches. Or you can recognize that the peace, the love, and the joy of the Lord that are the fruits of the Spirit have a purpose and a design with which you'll find that nothing needs to be done that is of our own flesh, but rather the Spirit of God gives us that capabilities of allowing Him to move in ways you never thought of. And that means touching hearts and minds and lives and people's sensitivities to making them tender, not tough. You see, a lot of people think that somehow faith in God makes you into some kind of raging, macho MMA artist that somehow you get to run out there like a Joshua and destroy the armies you know, by the sword of your might and by somehow conquering with strength of character. God is the opposite. God doesn't need you. God doesn't use you. God doesn't want you if you're operating in your own strength. If you think that you can do anything outside of God, He'll let you. And He'll wait. And over the years, you'll see what a failure you are and what a mistake you made to operate outside of the way that God wants you to operate on the inside. And that is to be a witness and a testimony of His love, not of His power, not of His might. He doesn't need you to do any of that. As a matter of fact, you have already failed him if you think that's what you're here for. You're here as a testimony and a witness of the suffering servant who came and died and gave his life for the sins of the world, for everyone in the world, including people you hate or claim to hate, including people that don't know any better, including people that might seek to kill you because you're already saved and you're already spending eternity in heaven. What difference does it make if your life is cut short? or if you live a long and full and prosperous life. What difference does it make at all if you're going to be living in eternity? So the reality of what we're doing and the reality of what we're saying ought to be pointing to Jesus and reminding people of what He said about loving your enemies, about blessing those who curse you, blessing those who despitefully use you and abuse you. Jesus didn't live in a vacuum. He lived in a world that's far worse than anything we've ever experienced. You're not in slavery. I'm sorry. You're not compelled to go a mile and walk the extra mile voluntarily. You're not there as a slave unto the whims and the nature with which those in charge and authority want to kill you for what you've said, much less what you've done. And you're just there to die for the sins of the world. And even then, likewise, not of your own will, but that of the Father even to the point of teaching you obedience, like Jesus did. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And he did suffer. And that may be what you're doing right now when you choose to hate the president, choose to hate Muslims, choose to hate Mormons, choose to hate anyone. If you're hating at all, you are the opposite extreme of what God wants to do in you to make you supremely His, to make you completely His to make you an example of what a Christian ought to be. Christianity was defined as those little Christ that loved even unto death. They were singing and marching into the lion's den, not singing and marching in a worship service 
where no persecution had come. The reality of who we are ought to be what we are and what we say we are, not what we think we ought to make other people believe in. Because that's what happens with hatred. Hatred never fulfills its own purpose. Hatred and people that hate never accomplish anything except to maim, to destroy, and to tear down. To steal joy, peace, and love from the world. People that hate are of the spirit of Antichrist. They are the false anointing, the false perspective of that with which God has given us. To reveal himself and to reveal his son. To reveal his love to the world. That we as Christians must demonstrate that love, even loving not our lives unto death. That we as Christians ought to love our enemies, as Jesus has said. And we ought to do what Jesus told us to do. And if we're not, then I would question whether or not you say you're a Christian, or whether God says you are one. You cannot worship God without loving Him. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Jude 21 Both the Old Testament and the New Testament teach that the essence of true worship is the love of God. It is the love of God that draweth men to repentance, not the fear. Our Lord declared that this is to be the sum of the law and the prophets. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Now, love is both a principle and an emotion. It is something both felt and willed. It is a choice to do. And as you do, it is a choice to feel if you choose to feel so. It is capable of almost infinite degrees. Love in the human heart may begin so modestly as to be hardly perceptible and go on to become a raging torrent that sweeps its possessors before it in total helplessness. It can be and should eventually be like loving like a hurricane. Something like this must have been the experience of the Apostle Paul for he felt it necessary to explain to his critics that his apparent madness was actually the love of God ravishing his willing heart. He loved like a hurricane. In the love which any intelligent creature feels for God, there must always be a measure of mystery. It is even possible that it is almost wholly mysterious and that our attempt to find reasons is merely a rationalizing of a love already mysteriously present in the heart as a result of some secret operation of the spirit within us. We can be certain that it is quite impossible to worship God without loving Him. Scripture and reason agree to declare this, and God is never satisfied with anything less than all. This may not be at first possible, but the inward operation of the Holy Spirit will enable us in time to offer Him our poured out fullness of love. The love of God is directed and objectified in the way that we treat each other. As we choose to love the Lord our God, we don't pull a Saul and go out and kill in the name of God to somehow please God or to say to God that we love Him by killing people. We'll fail miserably as Saul did. But the love of God was demonstrated by Paul who after killing those or choosing to participate in the death of those who called themselves Christians, rather he went out of his way and suffered those things that he had done unto others was done unto himself so that he would live out the days of his life even to the losing of his life to the witnessing to Nero himself and to those people around him that he loved with the love of God in him for those that God had so loved the world that he sent his son and that Jesus so loved that he prayed from the cross Father forgive them for they know not what they do don't come to me and tell me you're a Christian and turn around and post lie deceive connive finagle or in any way participate in some shadow of turning by attacking the President of the United States of America or slamming other people and saying you're a Christian 
You may be a fleshy person who follows the teachings of Jesus. You may be a carnal person who follows after what you think God is. But don't tell me that's what Jesus is. Because the word Christian means Christ-like. And Christ-like means to be crucified like Jesus was crucified, which was for those very people who were killing him at the time he was dying. Even the very centurion who saw him at his crucifixion said, Surely this is the Son of God. That means what a Christian is, a son of God. Don't dare to choose to take those people that Jesus died for and then crucify them on the altar of your religious persecution, thinking that somehow you're a holier-than-thou prophet, that you're called to hate when God has said you are told to love. There is no justification at all for any realization of hating anyone or anything that God has so said in his word that he loves the world. And I don't care what you've been through, I don't care where you go, and I don't care what you do. Because most of us have a story. And you don't know mine, and I don't know yours. But the one story I am interested in is that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. And more importantly, I'm more interested in this one story that when I didn't know and had no reason to know at all the mercy and love of God, He reached down and saved me. He chose me and He chose to save me. And that is why I love the world. And I love the President of the United States. And I love the Muslim. And I love the Mormon. And I love anyone that is created in the image of God because the potential of the love of God to cause a man to repent is always there. As long as that man has breath inside of his lips, as long as he has a heart that beats, as long as he has a mind that works, he has the opportunity with which God can perform a miracle and save that man from hell. What kind of Christian do you think you are if you can hate and justify it? before a holy and righteous God who says, I am pure, I am holy, I am righteous in all my ways, and so he gives his son to die for you. Pardon me, but how dare you trample the blood of Jesus Christ which is able to save sinners from sin? How dare you take that with which God has done and treat it as not for those with whom need more so that very salvation that you've been given so freely so, by the grace and mercy with which God has given it to you, you ought to be the ambassador thereof of the same, forgiving those who do not deserve forgiveness, having mercy upon those who don't deserve mercy, giving unto those grace with which they have no reason to expect any grace whatsoever, but rather an expectation of hell itself. Oh my God, how dare we ever criticize that with which God has placed over us in authority in order to reveal to us our attitudes and heart, our intentions, our contentions with what God has done rather than trust in the Lord with all our heart meaning not in our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledging Him, letting Him direct our path, and letting Him choose whom He places in authority. We can pray for and change the system. Don't get me wrong. You can change the heart of the king anytime you want to. Pray and God can turn the king's heart left, right, sideways, up, down. He places those in authority and He sets those down, nations included, that He chooses as He chooses to do. But do you think you're really fit to be in God's position to make determinations of condemnation when salvation is the message that you've been given to share with the entire world? How dare you stand in the presence of God and act like God? The psalmist declares, Oh, now ye are gods, but you will die like men. I would rather die in the mercy, the grace, and the forgiveness I've been given, and to extend that outward to every single living creature on earth, as well as every single being that is created in the image of God, that God has declared that He gave His Son for, than to err and exclude even one 
that God might exclude me in the same way from the love that the Son has and the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for that one person that you decided wasn't fit for the kingdom of God.